All right. Hey guys, Ryan here. Give me a quick shout out. Let me know if you can hear me and you can see the screen. Awesome. Hey George. Hey Andrew. Great. All right, guys. I am uh, excited today. We have Robert Hodry. Uh, did I say the last name correctly, Hodry? Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And uh, so he is an environment artist over at id Software. I saw his work and I knew you guys needed to meet him and we needed to have this conversation and talk about his work and about what he does. Um, so if you've got questions, uh, push them through <laughs> as you need in the chat, wherever that's available, or uh, wait for the Q and A if you're the one, if you're watching this live. And uh, Robert, thanks so much for joining. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. So uh, why don't we start and tell me, uh, tell us what you do now. Uh, I'm currently uh, still an environment artist and mm -hmm. it's software. So we call they called them uh, world builders so but we are doing a lot of different things so we don't have a dedicated prop team or texture artist so the whole art team is basically uh, one big group of environment artists and we do a lot of different things from props textures and weapons and yeah everything that gets into the game i guess and <clears throat> you don't have that very often especially in uh, triple a games yeah. you have very dedicated people, groups, and uh, like uh, at Critic, for example, we had a group of uh, vegetation artists and um, more of hard surface artists. I'm not saying that, of course, some people are better at sculpting, some are better at uh, hard surface. Everybody has, has strengths, and uh, so that's why, uh, yeah, we're very flexible. So if you're good at hard surface, for example, I'm a better at uh, hard surface stuff than sculpting. So I can recently was working on a weapon, but I'm also doing a lot of layouts, world building, and yeah, whatever you're uh, comfortable with. And you just can ask for, hey, can I work on this and that? And uh, that's a good thing about having a small team. We are not really that big. I think right now, environment artists, how many are we? 20, 25? Mm. And uh, yeah, that's <laughs> pretty small for uh, working on a AAA game. And uh, we don't really outsource at all. Uh, actually, we don't outsource at all, yeah. Really? No <laughs> outsourcing all. at all? No, not really. No. We have uh, two uh, character artists, mm -hmm. outsourcing contractors. Yeah. But that's it. I mean, uh, all props, everything is done in-house. We have uh, machine games helping out with concepts a little bit right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> we are, uh, yeah, because we are within the Zenimax family, so we are helping out with our projects. Like we were also helping out for Wolfenstein uh, 2 for uh, how long was it? Half a year or so? And uh, yeah, so basically uh, the programmers, our team, and I think Arcane Austin also helped out a little bit. When uh, yeah, whenever they need to ship a game, <laughs> you have your deadline, your date when the game needs to ship, and when you see oh okay, or we're a little bit behind, so that's when uh, some other studios can help out, which is actually really great. So you always have the opportunity to work on a different, a lot of different projects. So uh, it was what, kind of nice. Huh? Why, don't, why don't we head over to your portfolio so everybody can see your work? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh... <clears throat> Okay, and uh, yeah. how do you train for a position like that? Because that, so you're telling me that inside environment arts uh, and inside that art department, you, there's not like somebody who specializes in guns. Um, there's not somebody who specializes in hard surface, even though their skills might be there. So how do you train for that? Um, <clears throat> well, maybe uh, um, I was a little bit wrong about it. I mean, we have uh, one dedicated weapon artist right now. Okay, one, yep. Uh, and we used to have a prop team. They were doing all the props from hard surface, organic stuff. Mm -hmm. But now we kind of switched or changed our, our workflow and uh, everybody's doing everything right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but yeah, how do you train for that? I mean, uh, first off, you need to know what you enjoy the most. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if you don't like uh, hard surface or weapons and all this, just don't focus on it. <laughs> That's the only advice I can give. I mean, <laughs> it sounds fair, stupid. But... Fair enough. But you know, the thing with um, with people who are in the beginning stages, 
is they're making a sacrifice. You know, they're like, I maybe don't like this, but this is something that's going to be good for a job. So I'm going to try to put energy there. You know, there's that transactional quality when we're just starting out and, you know, maybe they don't know what they like. So yeah, yeah. How, how do they, you know, how do they start to discover what, you know, and maybe how did you start to discover what you like? Uh, for me, it was a little bit different because it was uh, such a long time ago when I started. Mm-hmm. I mean, back then, uh, how long was it already? 15 years. Uh, it was different because you had kind of companies release their SDK. You could mess around with editors. And uh, I started basically in the modding community for mm. uh, Quake 3. I was releasing uh, levels like uh, here you can see some of the really old levels. Like this was one of my first levels I released for the modding community in Quake 3 and it was fun. So I basically started making multiplayer levels for this game. And uh, yeah, so I got a couple of them. <clears throat> and I just published them online, released them. I wasn't really thinking about having a career in uh, and as an environment artist or so. Mm-hmm. I just, I don't know, enjoyed making those levels. Not many people played them because they weren't that good. Yeah, but uh, yeah, after a couple of levels, I don't know, uh, after multiple levels, I switched over to uh, some single player mods I released for Prey. Yeah, this one uh, took quite a while to finish those. Like, I think in general, for a multiplayer level, it took me between two and four weeks, and uh, for single player levels, it was like half a year or so almost. And uh, yeah, after I released stuff and people liked it and then uh, some other professional artists or designers approached me and asked me if I would be interested in working for their company. And that kind of got me thinking, okay, maybe I could have this as a career. So, (laughs) Uh, but I was still studying. So I first wanted to finish it and then kind of think about what to do. But at some point, I was like, okay, I can try it out and have this as a career. Yeah, but that was that was back in the day when, you know, like just knowing software was a big deal, right? Yeah, yeah. It and, was really different. Yeah. So, I mean, this might be a good segue actually to Todd's question. And Todd, I think I'll, I'll, um, I'm going to ask this in a simple way now, and then we'll spend some time later seeing if we can unpack it. But um, now the question is, uh, well, first, let's let's ask this because this is one of the things that we've heard a lot from people, and that's that if you're going to be an environment artist, you got to kind of be a 3D generalist to some extent. Do you agree with that or disagree? Uh, yeah, I kind of agree. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, it's getting tougher, I would say, every day to <laughs> be an environment artist. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not that hard to get a job if your portfolio and work is good. It's really not that hard. Yeah. The, tough part is just to have a good portfolio <laughs> right so, yeah that's yeah. like uh, one of my teachers used to say you know rocket science it's not that hard you know and, and hey. like, yeah if you're a rocket scientist but yeah. you know it's a little hard for some of us to get there so but you know uh, so now that begs the question like from your perspective what do you look for in portfolios and <clears throat> You know, what are some of the things that kind of trigger you to say, hey, this person's on the right path or, hey, this person is on the wrong path and they got a long ways to go? Uh, well, actually, I have a little article if somebody's Sweet. interested in. So I answer a lot of questions here. So just type in, um, I don't know, yeah, this title or so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm going through, okay, like questions, how to become an environment artist and all this. But I can... <clears throat> briefly uh, answer some of the questions. So um, yeah, what do you need in your portfolio? It's uh, for an environment artist, I would say, of course, props <laughs> and uh, being familiar with all the tools, mm-hmm. like at least a 3D package, Maya, 3D Studio Max or Modo, it doesn't really matter what you prefer. And then of course, texturing of Substance Painter Designer is the way to go these days. Uh, Photoshop still valuable, so you still need to know uh, the tool. And uh, it would be also nice to know at least a sculpting package like um, ZBrush or a 3D Code right. or what else is there. <clears throat> and 
looking at some portfolios, I mean, a lot of people, they uh, have mainly props, which is fine. So uh, you can take a concept from somebody else and do it or make a prop out of it or uh, just do something generic. Doesn't really matter, table, chair. So at least uh, be familiar with PBR and all the latest, like Unreal Engine is really good to present your work or <clears throat> environments take a lot of time, but I've seen so many portfolios and people becoming environment artists without a single environment mm. in their portfolio, which, so, I mean, when you start your, as an intern, junior, whatsoever, you're not tasked to do a big environments. So right. you normally start the first year you're doing props or optimization work and not really have the responsibility to take one white box area and finish it till the end. So uh, just be familiar with the whole workflow, making high polys, baking them down to a low poly and texture them and uh, be familiar with making tileable textures and um, yeah. and. Uh, it's also important, I would say, to have a good uh, presentation. So have a nice rendering setup, lighting or whatever uh, for your high polys, for your final meshes with textures and uh, just, uh, yeah, leave a good impression on your portfolio. It's like presentation is worth a lot. And sometimes you have, I mean, it's not everything. Sometimes you have some people with, they are not really good at presenting this stuff, but you can tell, okay, their low polys are really good, their high polys and everything's clean. So it's more forgiving when they don't present it in the nicest way. Some people just make uh, screenshots of the viewport in, I don't know, ZBrush or Max. That's totally fine. Mm -hmm. As long as you can see the work is good. But of course, it's always nicer to have a good presentation. Is there is there anything that like bugs you or that's a trigger if you see it then you know it's telling you something's like it they're just it, it's not a fit or they're a bit on the amateur uh level because i'm sure you you know you see a lot of work so you probably have you have to have like these shortcuts you can't look at everything in depth there's got to be some things that just start to say okay no okay no <clears throat> yeah there's uh actually it doesn't take long to see if somebody's good or not especially for art Mm -hmm. uh, you just have a quick look and to know if the portfolio is good. And uh, yeah, like if somebody is sloppy at the modeling, you see a lot of smoothing group arrows and um, just some weird stuff. And then it's always hard to say, okay, that's immediately it's like, mm, okay, he's not really that great and he's mm -hmm. maybe doesn't know better or so, but. Um, or, uh, yeah, see, like, for example, in character, because that's something that um, is big f in for me, um, it, I'll look at people's elbows and their hands, and then I know, you know, like, they just haven't taken anatomy all the way, and they're still in the amateur level. Is there something like that with um, with environments? You know, the smoothing group makes a lot of sense if there's, if there's little errors around there and the normals and, you know, artifacting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, for environments, it's, uh, there's so many things to consider, like, okay, the modeling, the composition, layout, and uh, you also have to make props for it and texture them, and lighting is also a big thing. Uh, for beginners, I'm uh, more forgiving when I see, okay, the lighting is not that great or so, because mm -hmm. normally you have lighting artists that take care of that. And the composition, of course, you have concept artists, art directors, that give you overpaints and say, hey, you or have a lead and other senior guys telling you, yeah, that, that doesn't work so great, so just change this and that. So I would say it's just know your fun fundamentals like uh, modeling and texturing and be uh, clean with your work. Don't be too sloppy and uh, yeah, that's, I don't know. Awesome. That makes sense. I'm, I'm not sure if it's <laughs> answering your question, but yeah, sometimes you just look at some uh, asset and you know it's good or it's bad, and yeah, or high polys, like, I don't know. 
Yeah. Well, stuff. what was um, Todd's asking? What was your first gig out of um, uh, in the game industry? <clears throat> Losing my voice here. <clears throat> uh, I started with uh, where's my so uh, here's my yeah. I started I think in uh, 2009. I mm -hmm. got an internship at Crytek in Frankfurt, and uh, I was fortunate enough to my first game I worked on was basically a triple A game, really popular, Crisis 2. The franchise was really big back then. And yeah, it was tough at the beginning. <laughs> so many things I had to learn, but mm -hmm. it was also pretty rewarding to see it released and uh, posters on the streets and marketing and all this. So yeah. I kind of started on this. It was a really big game. And yeah, I uh, spent like, I think five years at the company worked on another crisis game, Crisis Free, and uh, yeah, then another Rise of Rome was completely different uh, setting, kind of a Roman game, a third person game, action mm -hmm. adventure. And but we also had a studio, actually, they had a lot of different studios, so we I also was lucky enough to help a little bit on Homefront. And uh, yeah, Warface was another big free-to-play multiplayer shooter. Mm -hmm. So I had, I worked on uh, mostly, of course, first-person shooters, but they were so different from each other. So that's why I was kind of lucky to always have some great games to work on, which were different and from multiplayer, single-player campaigns, and all this. And uh, you learn a lot. I mean. Working on a multiplayer game is so different from single player games like or for example Rise Son of Rome was really cinematic driven. That was also a good experience to know, okay, you always have to be careful not to interfere with cinematics and all this, keep that in mind and mm -hmm. and uh, of course the single player games or multiplayer games, it's just making sure they are fun, visuals are coming later then or are also important, but it's always to keep in mind if it's fun. And uh, oh, what is this? Oh, there's a request for a review. Oh, <laughs> oh sorry. <laughs> see, now that, by the way, guys, just so everybody, so if you're listening to this, you didn't see what happened, but Edison posted his link in there and he got his link uh, clicked. So, <laughs> oh, okay, just <laughs> adding it. Do. We'll do that, Edison. Don't worry. I'd love to, I'd love to do that. So, let's take a look at your work real quick, um, Robert, if you yeah. don't. And, uh, and you just recently joined ID, right? About three years ago? Two. Uh, yeah, three, half, four years almost. So, uh, yeah, I started basically when they were uh, done with their verdict slides and uh, when they were in the middle of production for Doom. Yeah. So it uh, took a while to get my work visa. So, uh, but then, yeah, I worked pretty much the whole full production on Doom. Uh, where can I show some stuff? So uh, some environments, uh, yeah, I was mainly doing world building, like, I don't know, corridors, environments, mostly layouts, buildings, um, also set dressing, uh, beautification, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. <laughs> decaling a little bit at the end. And world building in a hard surface environment is it's the hallways it's it has it's not is it modeling the actual modular pieces or is it more assembly or is it everything? Uh, it's pretty much everything. So we get a block out from level designers and then a concept and uh, maybe I can show really quickly like for this building. Oh, give me one second. Mm -hmm. Why is it? Hmm. Where is it? I'm not sure if it's on that station. But yeah, normally we get a concept for everything because we're doing a lot of sci fi and stylized stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, for this building, I got a block out and then overpaint, and then I started detailing it. And uh, it's basically how we work. So, um, it's not... so you start with the concept, and the concept came with a 3D block out, right? Uh, it depends. I mean, uh, most 
concept artists these days, they also do a quick blog out in mm -hmm. uh, Maya or SketchUp or whatever yeah. they use. And that's really helpful for us as a world builder. So you can use their blog out. The proportions are always there. You don't have to figure out too many things. And um, yeah, and then from that, we start uh, normally just, yeah, adding more details, texturing a quick uh, texture pass, not really caring too much about UVs or anything, uh, just getting the idea in and then later on when I mean it's also good for lighting artists when they have some materials to work with and that's why okay just quickly add some textures there but later on when everything gets into the polishing phase you're doing your UVs and everything correct and uh, making sure everything is nice and yeah but after we're doing a first art pass normally you get another overpaint and with more detailing passes and all mm -hmm. this and, and polish and it's kind of a, yeah, uh, between process uh, from level design to uh, concept art to world builders and then back to design again if they're happy with what we're doing. So if their block out still works and combat and everything and yeah so that so is it fair to say that there's definitely some overlap between the world building and the concept so they start they get you the basic you start world build you start building and putting your details in at the same time that they're painting and putting theirs in or do you have uh, to wait to be to get stuff from them well normally uh yeah the level designers block something out it they sometimes they don't even know like for multiplayer Oh, well, actually, multiplayer was a bit different, but single player, they just do some uh, block outs that work well, are fun, and then concept artists go over and do overpaints, mm -hmm. what it could be, and then we as a world builder do uh, our, um, our art stuff and even quick lighting passes, and then we get uh, another overpaint and <clears throat> But we we always try to stick to the block outs. That's the main important thing I would say. Is like don't change the block out too much. Always talk to your level designer. If it's okay to make those art changes, it will change a little bit the block out. Most of the time they are okay with it. But yeah, so just make sure you're not going crazy and adding too much stuff in the player path and all this. Are you doing lighting at this stage too? Mm -hmm. Normally, uh, yeah, it's you can do it if you want to do it, I would say. It helps a lot, so just throw in quick lights and um, like here in this example, I was doing uh, like placing some lights where I would love to have them like here. And then later on, the lighting artists, they just look at it and you can talk to them. Hey, it would be cool to have maybe the lights here, there, or have this color theme. Uh, I mean, most of the time they have a lighting chart for every level, so they know already, okay, this level needs to have this kind of mood, like more cold, industrial, or warm, and whatever. But yeah, uh, for me, it also helps to work with when I know, okay, I'm placing lights here, so I can add more details in that area. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, as a world builder, you kind of, or environment artist, you kind of do a little bit of everything. Yeah. And yeah, like that's kind of exciting. You think about gameplay, lighting, and uh, where all your particles and textures and where to put all your details. It's always important to not spend too much time or energy on details that the player would probably never see or just run by. Mm -hmm. So you always want to make sure, okay, people will actually see it. <laughs> hmm. So much is involved in this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's why it takes so long. I mean, <laughs> for uh, some environments, I mean, that's kind of a little bit of a frustrating thing. You, I don't know, it's easier when you're just making a prop, you know, okay, I spend a, maybe a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and then it's done. Mm -hmm. And you finish the texturing, everything, you can present it in a nice way. Mm -hmm. But with environments, it's like from the beginning of production till the very, it's, you can only like, I don't know, you see it's 
like it can take a couple of months before you have lighting pass and looks nicer. You always work in um, rough blockouts, proxy mm -hmm. meshes, everything is not really nice and detailed. And uh, for an artist, you always want to, I don't know, go ahead and uh, already do a detailed pass and everything, but you always have to wait a little bit and okay, make sure blockout works and maybe even later on there will be design changes and that's why it's, you start with proxy meshes uh, blockouts and then uh, after it's getting reviewed and everybody's fine with it then you start adding a little bit more details but it's still not that nice looking or mostly gray boxes textures are not really uh, that maybe finish or so but mm -hmm. uh, can it's really time consuming and <laughs> yeah how do you deal with the overwhelm because i'm sure it gets overwhelming at times right just so much and it never ends yeah uh sometimes it can be really overwhelming i mean you get a blog out you don't know what to do it's all kind of crazy <laughs> and you get an area to work on and uh, it's all like with multiplayer for example you have a blog out and yeah, and okay, you get a concept and you know where it's going. Yeah. But still, then you think about, okay, um, how do I work on this in a most efficient way? So because uh, you don't want to spend too much time on unique meshes. So you always have to think, okay, how can I break this up uh, with modulars, uh, kit pieces, and how can I be more efficient? Because... I know, for example, Rage is a good example with the mega texture. Everything was kind of unique, and that's why it was so time consuming to finish the game. And, uh, but yes, yeah, sometimes, I mean, that's what most companies are doing. They have modular pieces, kit sets, and uh, of course, they also have unique uh, meshes, areas, especially for multiplayer. You can't really have. It's more flex, or actually, it's easier to sometimes make it more unique because the areas are so small and uh, uh, like this area here. It's, it's a little not really modular. Everything is kind of unique because the layout was so crazy and <laughs> always different. So it was kind of hard to make uh, modules out of that. And uh, especially when it's the areas are smaller, like open world games or so, or bigger game uh, areas, it's easier to just place your modules. Hmm, that's actually that's an interesting point. So you're saying in, in some cases, you know, modularity just doesn't work? Uh, it really depends. Like here's a good example with modularity and unique meshes. So mm -hmm. like all those pillars, all those elements, art rays, they are all modular pieces. Yeah. And it was really fast, like those pillars here, the floors, everything you can see it's modular and it's really fast to place everything yeah but uh, or here everything kind of modular but it also depends on the style i would say sometimes mm -hmm. like as i said this example here the whole terrain is kind of unique mesh because yeah it was just <laughs> because the layout was kind of a little bit different crazy um, what else? Modularity. Uh, mm, yeah, it really depends on. I mean, uh, do you have an example where you, ever, there was more unique meshes than modules? Uh, yep. Yeah, I mean, for Doom 2016, we uh, kind of all those corridors areas they were really unique. Oh, okay. Sometimes a little bit time consuming uh -huh. so like here in this you can tell okay it's not really built up in a modular way right and uh where else well you spend a lot of a lot of time in the hallways in doom you know and especially with the lighting and the all of that so yeah i mean we could have probably built it a little bit smarter with more modules kits and all this mm -hmm. um but in the end i think it kind of got a Every corridor had a little bit of a unique look, maybe a little, yeah. So, is there a, I, a penalty for that? 
Uh, well, it takes a little bit longer, I would say. <laughs> longer so, to produce, uh, but does it, so that like it's more of an investment for the for the studio in terms of the artist time, right? Yeah, um, I'm not against modularity. Uh, it's really it's, can save a lot of time, but of course you can then always tell. Okay, some corridors they, I mean, corridors are not that important in games anyway. They are, mm -hmm. most of the time they are just generic corridors, so. Yeah and have them in a modern way. But you always also have uh, like big vistas or epic moments and they kind of tend to be more unique. So that's why like here also another corridor, pretty modular. And yeah, for corridors, I would say it makes sense to make them more modular. Mm -hmm. um, what else? That's pretty cool to hear, though, because we hear a lot about modularity. Um, but would you say, if you're looking at somebody's portfolio, would you say it's important for them to showcase the fact that they do modularity, or would it be important for them to showcase a really cool environment? Um, well, I mean, when you're reviewing portfolios for candidates you want to hire, it's always kind of a plus, I would say, if they work in a smart way. So mm -hmm. if they have an environment and you can see, okay, they had uh, their modules, they build it in a very smart way, they don't make the mistake of having everything unique. It's always a plus, I would say. So they okay. think about before they start working, which is always good. Um, but there's nothing wrong about it. I mean, as long as it looks good, we. I mean, you can learn all those things or be more efficient and smart about it. Yeah. Uh, I think it's more important to have nice art and uh, how you do it. It's not the most important thing in the world, I would say. Just, yeah. Okay, that's good to hear. You know, and I, I this is a point that I always try to get from people, whether or not um, the important thing is how you got there or, you know, or where you get. You know, so it's the thing that I like to think of or like to tell people is it's kind of like a first date. You know, your your first job is to really impress. And then they get to know you. Did you, did you do that well? Did you do that efficiently? But the first the first moment has some flash to it, I think. Wear nice clothes. Uh, you mean for the interview? Wear no, nice clothes? No, or... I, but by nice clothes, I mean like, you know, focus on your, your portfolio being a great portfolio, not – Hey, I know I did all the topology. I did all the everything's you know modular. Everything's as efficient as possible. Frame rates at 120 frames a second in Unreal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, uh, of course it's nice if they have it optimized and uh, you can see. Oh, it will probably run really smooth and uh, build up in a smart way. But uh, I don't think it's that important. I mean, for your portfolio, you always end up adding more triangles, having a bigger texture resolution, all this. Yeah. So just make it look good in your portfolio. <laughs> and that's why, I don't know, you don't have to be super efficient with everything. Just present it in a nice way, especially as a beginner. I mean, you learn so much at your first job and you always end up making mistakes. I mean, I still end up making a lot of mistakes when I <laughs> do some stuff. So you always kind of learn and grow but especially for beginners when they fresh out of school and look for a first job i wouldn't expect them to be on a production level it's like okay you made mistakes that's fine as long as you know how to make good art have a uh, good eye for a, i don't know aesthetics composition colors whatever that's really important for environment like this and yeah like uh, i don't know some seen also art tests, people doing uh, high polys for everything, baking down everything unique, and that's fine. I mean, as long as it looks good in the end, just, of course, when you see it, you think, oh, that's not really efficient, but, well, you can teach them how to be more efficient. So it's not like when you have your first first job, nobody talks to you, you have to work all on your own. You will constantly, normally you have a experienced senior guys looking over your work and always telling you or giving you tips and giving you feedback and helping you. So yeah, it's 
it's normal to make mistakes, even especially at the beginning. So great. Well, if you're up for it, I think Susan said, um, said we may do this. But if you're up for it, I'd love to show you some student work and do some critique. Of course, yeah. Oh man, that'd be so great. Okay, I'm gonna switch this over so that the screen is mine. But let me make sure I get rid of anything that <laughs> I don't want to immediately broadcast. Uh, okay, so there we go. All right, I am okay. the presenter, and you should be seeing my screen, and it's right there at Artist Awake. Uh huh. We'll get my mug off there. Um, Anna, since Edison was the first one, let's see who else was asking for work review. Daniel was, so I'm going to look at Edison. <coughs> uh, Daniel's posted his, and um, and then I think I also want to talk um, where he's not in here. I also want to talk about Harry's work, so I'll put that up there, but I don't see Harry here, so we'll make that happen, and I think... We might throw Ira up. I'm not sure Ira's here, but um, this will be a good one to get in there. Ira, are you in? No, she was busy working on that model. Okay. And uh, if you got some more, let's go. There's Kyle. Let me just get all these going, guys, so I know exactly how much I have to, like, how much time I can spend on each. Okay, I'll give you another 30 seconds to post them in there. And uh, Etne is the last one. Okay. All right, we'll start with Daniel was the first one to ask. Oh, Suri, good. I'm glad you're there, Suri. Okay. And then we will do Edison. Then <coughs> there. All right, guys, I'm closing that part of the chat. So um, let's take a look at Daniel's work. Daniel, you got your mic uh, as well, so don't hesitate. Um, unmute yourself, and uh, I'll pr prep this. Um, Robert, Daniel uh, is in the Environment Artist Boot Camp, and the thing that we do in the boot camp is focus on props in the beginning, and then we work our way to environments. It depends on what they end up doing. In this case, Daniel created two props, and then instead of doing an environment, he did this um, this hard surface thing that you see right here in the middle, the robot mm -hmm. arm, and it ended up taking you know all of his time. But you know he drilled down and really worked on the hard surface of it. And I think Chanel was was giving you some direction on that too, right, Daniel? All right, so we'll start here, mm -hmm. and uh, this is what I ask them to do, a color uh, in-game model in the beginning with some of their topology right up there. Then we do the um, high res here so that you guys can see their bevels and you know whether the form is soft or sharp, and, and then we do textures. So um, if we just looked here, you just guide my uh, cursor wherever you want, and then you can just uh, let it go. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it's a really cool prop, so... Uh... Looking at the low polys, high polys, everything looks really clean, optimized, and yeah. Uh, just what was used for text ring? Substance painter. Substance painter. Yeah, that's good. I mean, yeah, that's the standard tool to use this as. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's a nice presentation. You have it from every angle, from behind, from the front perspective. And it's also nice to see some uh, more uh, standout props like, okay, looking at tables and chairs is not exciting, so it's nice to see your more uh, uh, slot machines. Okay, you've seen them sometimes, but not that often in portfolios, so it's always nice to have props that stand out a little bit from the mess. And yeah, cool. The textures look good, so. All right, I'm gonna. Nice prop. Thank you. I'm going to move uh, a little fast, guys. I'm going to look at another one. Uh, and so this is the same thing, uh, low res. Uh, I think he might, he uh, changed his presentation here, so it looks like that's the low res. You have to tell me, Daniel, low res, high res. But this should be the, the in-game render one right here. Yeah, it's not that low res, but mm -hmm. more of a mid-low. Yeah, is this the high poly or back down low poly or? He says it's, it's the mid. Yeah, exactly. It's the mid mid level actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty nice actually. Nice presentation. So, uh, yeah, I don't see any errors. Nothing okay. wrong. Looks really nice. 
Okay, I'm going to go to this next one, and then I'm going to ask a specific question on this. Um, so in this, um, is there anything about this that screams amateur to you? That just, you see it and you're like, this is this is what would maybe stop me from hiring you. And Daniel's saying this is just the high res. So I tell you what, Daniel, because that's just the high res. I'm going to switch back over here. Um, and Robert, is there anything about this that just, that hits you as a little amateur? Or is it all pretty reasonable? Uh, not really. I would say, I mean, it's definitely not amateurish. So the high poly is nice. Uh no baking arrows, uh, smoothing is all correct and right, texturing looks also fine. I mean, texturing is also, you can maybe spend, I don't know, add more scratches here and there and make it a little more grimy or whatever, but yeah, I think it's a really cool prop, so definitely shows he knows what he's doing, and that's what you're looking for when you hire interns or juniors. Cool. So he knows the whole process. Sure. Uh, I mean, presentation, lighting, sometimes, I don't know. For me, it's not that important. So you can also have flat shading as long as I can see everything. Sometimes mm -hmm. people kind of hide their assets in really dark, moody renderings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but here you can see everything. The only thing that I'm not sure what's going on is here in this area. Which now area? Which area? I'm not seeing your uh, here with the checkpot in the middle down there. That looks a little bit funky, but could also be the lighting. The reflection but, or something? Yeah, I yeah. don't know what's going on there, but okay. that's that's not too bad. I mean you always see even with professional artists having lots of experience, you always sometimes see a little here and there some errors, but that's not that bad. I mean Okay. It's long, yeah. It's a really good model efficient and cool all right let's head over to edison <coughs> edison do you have your um we'll start with the this is the project that he's doing in the boot camp and um mm -hmm. uh edison i want him to see your absolutely daniel okay so um we'll start here cool. and go from there and this is yeah this is the iray render pretty sweet huh Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> All those details are really nice. Uh -huh. That core looks amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, you could also make a generic, simple telephone, but in this case, you have some uh, really old, cool-looking uh, one, and with all those nice ornaments and stylized and all. Just yeah, it stands out from other portfolios I've seen, which is really nice. Cool. And so um, we asked him to put it in a scene. So he put this together pretty quick. I think this is just a day or two to, to get this scene in the background. But um, there we go. So that's the high res. There's the low res. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of polys in that chord, obviously. Yeah, and which is not too bad. I mean, yeah. Cool. No, that looks really good. I mean, yeah. That's... Okay, great. Uh, let me head over, though. I do want... Um, to look at the current project. I don't know if you necessarily want him to see that, Edison. I know it's not up to where you are right now, but um, so he's in progress on this, been in progress and working and, and busting his butt for a while, doing modularity uh, and all of that. So he's been doing these like test scenes mm -hmm. um, to make this. So I'll show you this, and then um, I want to just show you the final product or not the final, but the one where he's at now. And just, you know, just like what are two or three things that right off the bat you think he needs to address? Um, well, this is an example where modularity is obviously uh, important. So mm -hmm. that's why I think it would be cool if he would also post the way he worked on and have different um, shots of the modules he's okay. using. Yeah, he's got those. So, yeah, that's cool then, yeah. Great. And uh, I mean, it's nice, of course, but maybe also add some uh, props down there or so, or just have a little bit more. Because looking at it, it's just a generic, boxy looking building. Mm -hmm. So you could probably, I don't know, invest a little bit with some props and put them on the floor, on the ground or so, or give it a little bit more life, how right. to say. 
not saying that's a bad looking building or so it's just i've seen so many brick, brick buildings in portfolios already yeah uh, i mean it's true it's a different style but still it's just uh, generic blocky building so set dressing so, is probably going to be a, a big thing for him to do make sure he's uh, yeah, I mean, I would probably uh, spend a little bit more time and have a kind of little environment piece or so, uh -huh. because it doesn't take long. You can just have a little corner piece and uh, add some benches. And yeah. Something just, as I said, it's uh, a little, uh, it's hard to stand out from the mess with just uh, generic buildings. Mm -hmm. So it's not saying it's bad. I, I sound a little bit harsh, sorry. <laughs> No, harsh but, is fine. Harsh is fine because at least it's harsh up front, and we can see it and address it, as opposed to you know. Yeah, I'm just trying to be honest. I mean, yeah. uh, looking at a lot of portfolios, and uh, whenever I see uh, just a building facade, and then uh, sure, sometimes I often also then okay, if it's just a generic building, then I look closer at the textures. If they are really good, then okay, I can. Uh, look over the fact that it's just a boring building. Yep. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, like when you make a building or so, it, like with this little ornaments he has on the top, they are nice. Uh, just make it a little bit more complicated, add a little bit more interesting things other than just doors, windows, square looking windows, yep. and pillars that are also kind of blocky. And uh, do you care if it's matching real world reference or when you look at this, or are you just looking at this and saying, you know, it, it, this just, it's just a little boring. It should have this, it should have that. So did that question make sense? Um, yeah. I mean, uh, for those things, I would always use references. Mm -hmm. For example, when we worked on crisis two, it was set in New York. We also use real life reference for everything. And with the buildings, always make sure, okay, they are buildings that you can see in New York. Right. And I'm pretty sure he also used reference for this. Yeah. So I guess he can, could also post it or so. Because sometimes it's nice when people also post their reference and concepts they used. So you can see, okay, how good are they at following uh, concepts and references. Yeah. Because that's when you start, you normally always, or yeah, <clears throat> it depends on how big your team is, but normally you get a concept and you work off this concept and of course the directors and leads they want to see you follow that concept and right. normally you also want to improve on the concept but it should be close to the concept so got it all right great okay so i don't want to take up too much of your day let's take a look at um, i'm going to drop to the back to sari and we'll take a look at her um i don't even know what this is called but this is a uh, What's this called, Suri? Leather saddle bag, something of that nature. Uh -huh. So I'll just scroll through real quick. You can you can move my cursor wherever you want, but um, it's two yeah, different yeah. Uh, texture sets because it's two different um, bags. Uh, I really like the texture in that. So um, <coughs> yeah, I'm still trying to. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's a 4K texture, which is fine, and the polycon is pretty high, but it's a portfolio piece, so um, it's normally a prop like that would be way low res, and textures wouldn't that be that big, but uh, that's fine. So I'm just looking. On the top corner, is this the reference for it, or am I confused? Pretty sure that's reference. Yeah, yeah, I'm just looking at it. Yeah, she says it's um, reference. Oh, yeah. No, I really like the texture. Uh, here and there on the corners, it looks really sharp and uh, edgy, boxy compared to the reference. So you could have probably uh, smoothed it out a little bit. But other than that, uh, I think it's pretty close to the concept. So, which is good. So, or the reference, I mean. Mm -hmm. And yeah, all those little details in the textures are really nice. Yeah, it's a nice piece. Cool. Good deal. Uh, all right. And uh, Suri, I'll leave it at that. We'll see if I can come back. Um, I want to take a look at Harry's real quick. This is what he did um, 
at the end. And actually, uh, is there one? Is there any one thing that I should ask this of everything? Is there any one thing that strikes you as you, you know showcasing that Sari is a student? You know, uh, I, I want yeah, them. I think, yeah, talk to me. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think, but that's not bad. I mean, for most students, when I look at the work, I see okay the rendering lighting setup for the props, they are all kind of um, the same, I would say, playing <laughs> with the background, which is not bad, just have a plain gray background. Mm -hmm. But looking at, I mean, it's a really nice way to present your work. So you have every angle and uh, you see it from everywhere. So you can tell, okay, she's, or he or her spent uh, her time or uh, details on everywhere, not only like maybe at the front or so. Sometimes it's also nice to see when down there or so at the bottom how much detail they spend even there. Uh, it's just the uh, lighting in general. When I look at some students' work, they are just uh, a little bit flat, plain, mm -hmm. I would say. Got it. But that's not bad. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, <laughs> Same with my work. My lighting setups are also not that great. So other people I know, they get into key shot or uh, have some, I don't know, V-Ray renderings, whatever they use. And of course, it always looks really nice for your high polys. But for students, I don't think it's that important. Got it. OK, great. All right, so this is Harry. Harry, I don't think is with us um, right now. Uh, I do not see Harry in here. No, he's not. I'm going to see him tonight, actually. Um, and uh, so this is Unreal. This is actually mm -hmm. straight from um, Unreal. And uh, if we go through, so he's testing out some lighting, some volumetric fog. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and we've been uh, and he this was it. it his last week he fixed the glass and and whatnot so the week before um, I think this was the week before and we had issues with the reflection and we didn't have enough volumetric so mm -hmm. um, uh, and so there we go so now I think I'll just let you uh, I think it's really cool so it's a really interesting uh, area mm -hmm. so a lot of details on the crown, the crime dirt, and the lighting school, and the uh, uh, little details he placed with the, uh, where, what is this, uh, with the pictures on the walls, and mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, I mean, you don't always have to make the most complicated scene in the world. Sometimes, right. yeah, you can have a simple scene and uh, spend more time with lighting and decorating it. And it's as long as it looks cool, that's important. Yeah. And uh, I think that definitely looks good, so. That's great. And he, we totally built a, a kit for it, right? So he's got his, um, uh, oh. he's got, uh, well, these are the props. Let me see if I can go back to, yeah, there. So he's building his kits. So that that's is, great, yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, where else is the, oh yeah. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly how to make that that's work there we it's go. always There's nice yeah exactly. yeah yeah that's great it's always good to see how somebody worked with specific things okay how did they break it up and and here you can see okay uh with some pieces he used and did he use or reuse a lot of different things or is it just one giant unique environment and mm -hmm. some uh, prop shots and uh, lighting how everything comes together that's pretty nice to see. Great. And is there any one thing that you think he could change just to kind of, you know, in, increase his chances of a job? You know, because that's our primary thing. That's what I'm, I'm, you know, I'm focused on. So, uh, I mean, with environments, it's always a little bit tricky. You can always say, um, yeah, right. it's kind of hard to <laughs> call an environment finished. You will always find, okay, I could spend more time here and there. Yeah. But at some point, you just have to say, yeah, I'm done with it and move over to the next thing. Because, yeah, you don't have all the time in the world, especially <laughs> when you're looking for a job. You just, I would say, in your portfolio should, yeah. Okay, so would you say this definitely puts him in the realm of candidate for a junior environment art position, somebody that, you know, a team could uh, consider? Yeah, definitely. I mean, 
depends on of course what you're looking for so yeah. i mean you want to work for a sci-fi company or like uh, 343 industries or making right. halo games or whatever or you want to work on western game i don't know <laughs> it's hard to say or stylized games so yeah. because yeah if you're yeah it really depends on you if you're more into kind of cartoony games or whatever then i don't think you have he wants to work at uh, guerrilla games oh i see uh yeah i mean not saying i mean as long as your art is good uh companies are interested in you even if they have a different style so mm -hmm. as long as you're interested in their style and you show you have a lot of different things in your portfolio cool great thank you uh, all right let's uh, let's jump over to kyle and kyle is there a particular one you wanted me to look at in uh, the chest or the um bookshelf i will look at the chest chest all right and so this is uh, the low res here at the top i believe and then we go down i think there's some mix that's the sculpt yeah high poly low poly yeah the only high poly is the non-painted one okay there we go um yeah uh just trying to compare it with the reference yeah um looking at the texture so in the reference it looks like is it wood or metal or uh looks it's like iron. oh iron wood i mean you iron don't always have, yeah you don't always have to stick one to one to your concept or reference of course so you can do your own thing and like i like the mix of wood and iron so uh, that's really nice touch cool um just looking at the texture i think it, yeah i don't know the hmm? uh how to say it the wood looks maybe a little bit clean too clean or so hmm. but yeah it's not too bad I, cool maybe i'm staring too long at the reference <laughs> yeah it's different i can see that you know it's a darker dirtier yeah what you're responding to i think right it's just yeah the low part of the <coughs> asset has quite a lot of contrast in the texture and the reference not but mm -hmm. again yeah it's fine i mean got it all right great and a uh, quick look at this i think the low poly he's putting right here in the center <clears throat> anything strike you as um like amateur or uh something that's a problem for you just any one thing uh yeah well this might also sound a little bit harsh but <laughs> uh it's just i don't know really uh generic asset and uh, it's basically uh, just boxes and the texture is also quite noisy. It looks like just a photo texture slapped on it. Um, you could probably give it a bit more life by adding maybe books or stuff on top of it or just make it more interesting. But what I'm looking at right now is just a couple of boxes. Sorry. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Three. Great. Really um, direct. And, and uh, yeah, that's just... There's nothing wrong with making uh, shelves or tables, chairs, whatsoever. Just try to make them more interesting, I would say. Got it. Or if you just want to keep it simple, spend the uh, time on the textures and really make great textures. Um, but yeah. That's... <laughs> awesome. All right, thank you. Sorry, yeah. Okay, Josh. Uh, Josh, do you have something specific you wanted him to see? Because I'm seeing mostly character. And uh, while you're figuring that out, at Nini, is there something? And do you have something in Artist Awake? Okay, you're in 360, so you're still in the early stages. Uh, oh, environment. I keep forgetting that there's a 
process. But how long ago was that? Two years. I don't want to review something that was two years ago. And uh, that was a year ago. All right, let's do this. Um, I just start. Okay, cool. That's fine. So, uh, Josh, you want to skip yours? Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, so I think we can look at this might be a good moment, um, Robert, if you don't mind. This will be the last one that we look at. Mm -hmm. And um, you've been modeling for a long time. Uh, so how, just a quick conversation or a quick note, like how do you block out and start to work on um, I think he's doing this is still the this should be the high res um, yeah it looks like the high poly yeah, yeah. so any notes because I, I tell them that they should be following a construction mesh approach which means you know we want it to smooth into the model you know but we, but we're not afraid to spend polygons so it's like this is your moment in mm -hmm. Vegas we're gonna we're gonna pay the piper later but you know go spend your millions but um, any comments or thoughts about let's say first his topology um looks really clean i mean i don't see anything wrong with it so the high part itself yeah it's really nice okay um, do you do asymmetric asymmetrical stuff early or do you wait till that's at the end uh depends on the prop i mean looking at this i would probably also keep the main part symmetrical at first mm -hmm. lock everything out detail it later uh everything and then um uh yeah the card it's all unique and Sweet. um but then of course uh, you'd break it up this symmetry with a little bit like those um uh, two strings left and right they kind of still look a little bit symmetrical mm -hmm. and yeah that's it's always sticking out when stuff is uh, too symmetrical not saying it's bad here. I mean, the cord uh, around it uh, helps it a lot to break it up. But even, maybe even in this case, you could do a quick sculpting pass or so. I don't know. Depends on how much time you want to spend on it. But I think it's a nice high poly, yeah. So. Great. All right. <coughs> um, Todd, let me take a quick um, piece. And guys, I've got to get, uh, I've got, ah, yes. Actually, um, thanks, Todd. Mm -hmm. I wanted to I wanted to get some eyes on this because Todd's um, uh, spent a lot of time kind of getting this thing together. So there's the low res. This is the end game. Uh, glad you got this posted, Todd. And uh, and there you go. Pretty sweet. Yep, it definitely looks really good. Great. Uh... Now, what um what about these problems right here where you see how he's kind of got Right where my cursor is. Can you see my cursor? Yeah, yeah. See what you mean? Yeah. So, are these problems that they need to address? Is do how do you think about problems like that when somebody's at this stage? Uh, it, looking at it, I mean, sure. You see, it's the baking errors and UV. I should probably have a look at the UV then. But mm -hmm. for me, it's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, I can forgive when I see that, okay, I just look at the other things like the textures, models, and all this. Mm -hmm. Like baking errors, that's, <laughs> even I still got so many baking errors when I'm making props, so it's always a back and forward. So you go back, change some low poly stuff or UVs and bake it again. Yeah. But the rest looks really fine, so that's why I don't think it's a big issue. Okay, good. And, uh, yeah, the rest is he's got some serious depth to this texture. Yeah, I'm at this piece I'm mainly looking at the texture or so and it's really nice. So and whenever you're making props like this when you have metal or uh, just make sure it's uh, PBR correct and everything and use latest tech and engines because that helps a lot. So, yeah. Great. All right. Um so, Robert, thank you so much for coming in here, for sharing your thoughts and your perspective on people's work and for talking to us about yours. Yeah, no problem. It was really, really awesome to hear. And uh, and love, I love looking at your art station. It's just like an environment <laughs> artist's dream. Just so many cool things. 
Uh, thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, say hi to Jason for me, and uh, have a great uh, have a great uh, rest of your day. Uh, yeah. Thanks uh, for having me. And if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me on uh, whatever outstation or uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Over That's there at our station, everything's in his. Uh, I think it's all on your about page, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Contact information or so. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, great, hey, Robert. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks. Have a great day. You too. Thanks everybody for joining and for the character guys. Uh, I will see you guys in in that course in just a second. All right, ciao. See you. Bye. Bye.